Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast, Season 24, Episode 3, Caesar. This episode was written by Brandon Stanley. Brandon is a writer of poetry, fiction and non-fiction, currently residing in Abilene, Texas. He has been a student of information technology, technical writing, history and philosophy. Julius Caesar waged campaigns of strategic boldness and tactical prudence. He fused himself into both head of state and military commander, and in the chaos of the late Republic, where it became nearly impossible to distinguish war as politics by other means, Caesar waged both war and politics. In his success was sown the seeds of his demise, and that of the Republic he served. Caesar was just sixteen when his father died, leaving him as head of the family during the civil war that engulfed Rome, a war which centred around land reform and Caesar's uncle Marius. This war pitted the aristocratic optimate faction in the Senate against the popular democratising party. The optimates had a champion in Cornelius Sulla, who emerged victorious. As members of the popular coalition, Caesar's clan was on the wrong end of the subsequent Sulan dictatorship. Sulla's purge of his enemies harmed all the Marians, including causing Caesar to go into hiding. Through the intervention of his mother, Sulla commuted Caesar's death sentence, but Caesar still thought it prudent to stay away from Rome. He departed for military service in the Roman province of Asia. Caesar served with distinction in the army at the siege of Mytilene. He was decorated with the civic crown awarded by the Republic for saving other citizens' lives and killing the enemy. On the death of Sulla in 78 BC, Caesar decided to return to Rome to embark upon his political career. He gained the office of Iadile by buying votes. The new Iadile was permitted to carry out public entertainment, and Caesar footed the bill on credit. The office of Pontifex Maximus, or High Priest, was his next office, elected by public vote in 63 BC. The culmination of the cursus honorum, or course of honours for an ambitious Roman, was the consulship, the most powerful office in the Roman state, but attaining this meant Caesar was going to face opposition. The aristocratic party of the Senate was perpetually afraid of another Marius, and they saw this potential in Caesar. They could not stop him from becoming consul, but they could thwart his ambition by having him govern the province of the forests and pastures that were part of public land. They reasoned that this would prevent him from gathering armies and amassing wealth and fame. When Caesar heard of this move, he knew he had to do something radical. He therefore approached the wealthiest man in Rome. Marcus Licinius Crassus, as well as Rome's most famous general, Pompey Magnus, and formed a political alliance later known as the First Triumvirate. Caesar would stand for consul and support Pompey in Asia. Pompey would support Caesar in this effort, knowing that Caesar would pass an agrarian reform to benefit some of his former soldiers. Caesar would then be appointed governor of Cisalpine and Transalpine Gaul, as well as Illyricum, with four legions to command. An old enemy, the Gauls, had sacked Rome in 390 BC. The Gauls themselves were part of a larger Celtic group, but nearest to the Romans, located across the Alps in modern France. The first foreign challenge Caesar faced came when a Gallic tribe named the Helvetii approached Roman territory, threatening invasion. Caesar destroyed the only bridge leading across the Rhone to Roman lands. The Gallic tribe kept moving, next demanding passage from a Roman ally. Caesar first engaged in negotiation, while the armies waited on the Rhone. 
While Caesar assembled reinforcements, the talks broke down. The Helvetii kept on the march, probing along the Seine River, eventually finding a place to cross. Caesar attacked them when only a quarter of their fighting men were across. The Helvetii retreated and Caesar pursued them, instigating the Battle of Bibracti, near modern Autun in Burgundy. Outnumbered two to one, Caesar took a position on high ground. The Romans started by holding the subsequent Helvetian assault. The legions eventually forced the Helvetians back on their baggage. They begged for terms which Caesar granted, provided they leave Gaul and return home, where they would serve as a buffer against Germanic invasion. Meanwhile, a Germanic king by the name Ariovistus assisted a Gallic alliance in invading the lands of a Roman client tribe, the Idui. Attacking a Roman ally was an act of war. This pretext allowed Caesar to invade Gaul, not for the aggrandizement of Caesar and his men, nor for the Republic, but to prevent Roman allies from being attacked. Like any good official reason for war, this line of reasoning did have some justification for the Roman Senate and people. The invasions of the Cimbri and Teutons forty years earlier were still fresh in the memories of the Roman people. Caesar could not allow a Germanic king with a large confederation to establish itself in Gaul. After a diplomatic alliance of questionable sincerity, the Germans took omens not to join battle until the moon was full. Caesar heard of this and attacked them while they were in camp. Ariovistus was defeated, with 80,000 of his soldiers butchered, maimed or chained as chattel, and those who escaped were pursued back across the Rhine. The pacification of the majority of Gaul was almost complete. The Belgae, neither Germanic nor Gallic, were said to be fierce warriors who kept the Germanic tribes from overrunning their territory. The most powerful of the Belgae tribes were the Nervii. Once Caesar moved his forces into Belgica, every tribe but the Nervii surrendered and he continued his operation into this northeastern region until he came to the territory the Nervii called home. Caesar started to make camp on top of a hill overlooking the Sabis River. Suddenly, from surrounding thickets, came a horde of Nervii, charging across the river at its shallowest point. The Nervii assumed that the Romans would be vulnerable and spread out. According to Caesar's account, the fight was so severe that he called out to his beloved centurions of the Tenth Legion by name to encourage them to hold fast. Hard-pressed in the attack, small groups of Romans were cut down. Entire cohorts lost all their centurions. From afar, the barbarians hurled their weapons, and when the Romans responded, the Nervii were said to have caught the javelins and returned them in a volley. Caesar's troops fell back, but the Roman discipline prevented them from dissolving entirely. Containing the assault on the flanks and hurling another volley of their javelins, the Romans broke through the opposing ranks, reversed the tide, and shattered the tribesmen. Caesar turned the situation around by his example, leading from the front. Showing a penchant to try a bad idea at least twice, Germanic tribes again invaded Gaul. Caesar pursued the Germans to the Rhine and then built a minor engineering marvel, erecting a timber bridge across the expanse. Once complete, he surged forward with his men to chastise the two guilty tribes in question and terrorise the other Germanic nations. He was now free to muster a fleet and sailed to attack the British Isles. The pretext for this was that the islanders had rendered repeated assistance to the Gauls when Caesar had warred with them. The Roman force neared landfall, only to find many of the heights already occupied and commanded by local British troops. The infantry came ashore, with many of the boats having run aground due to a misjudgment of local tidal conditions. Troops had to fight while disembarking. The British greeted the struggling Romans with chariots which carried chiefs into the thick of battle before they dismounted and engaged with their enemies as footmen. 
The legionnaires survived this attack and pressed ahead. They managed to establish a camp and sent out foraging parties. These never returned. The official line, carried forward by writers like Plutarch, was that there was nothing worth conquering on the impoverished island. The truth was that Caesar was overreaching in launching a cross-channel invasion. Winter was coming, and the alacrity of these advances beyond the borders of the Roman world had tired the Caesarian soldiers. Gaul looked to be quiet under the sandaled heel of Roman power. To secure grain supply for the cold months and to properly garrison the expansive region, Caesar spread his men across the entire territory. He left each of his legionary commanders in charge of a section of the conquered land and expected to spend the season in quiet rest. But the Gauls had already seen a chance to avenge their initial defeat. Perhaps the Roman forces, small as they were, could have dealt with local unrest, but instead a simultaneous uprising across the entire region was organised. One legion, commanded by Sabinus, was surrounded. In a council of war, the commanders of the garrison were divided as what to do. The Gauls sent a delegation, offering to allow the Romans passage out of their lands. Agreeing to this, Sabinus led his men forth. Ambushed along the way, the legion was killed to a man. Caesar called together a meeting of Gallic nobility and commanded them to be loyal. His army marched rapidly, and the proconsul dispatched a letter to Pompey requesting extra troops be raised and sent to crush the Gallic rebellion. He burned villages as he passed through the country, destroying defenceless towns while the men of the communities were off attacking his subordinates. The Gallic besiegers were defeated or dispersed, quitting the fighting. Some tribes took to the woods and marshes, but two held out in their hostility and sent word across the Rhine to the restless Germans that they required assistance. The Germans refused to help the Gauls, advising them that they had made two recent attempts to foray into the province and did not wish to attempt fortune again. A chief named Vercingetorix commanded his people to fall back to their Iron Age hill forts and burn their crops. They denied the Romans open battle, following a Fabian strategy of grinding their opponents down. The Romans steadily lay siege to the principal towns where the Gauls had taken refuge, losing some engagements and winning others. The campaign culminated in the Battle of Alesia, where Caesar laid siege to that town. As other tribes rallied and mobilised to come to Vercingetorix's aid, Caesar set his army the task of building a second wall to defend against the Gallic relief force. At the eventual battle, the relief force attacked piecemeal, failing to break through Roman defences. Meanwhile, the relief force found it impossible to communicate with those under siege, so were never able to attack in concert. In a final act of desperation, Vercingetorix sent the women and children out from Alesia to find succour with the Romans, and perhaps live even as slaves. Instead, Caesar left them locked between the Gallic forces in Alesia and the Roman circumvallation. They presumably starved their pawns in a war of nerve between the two leaders. Vercingetorix was eventually crushed at Alesia, dragged to Roman chains, and strangled as a public spectacle. Meanwhile, the triumvirate had dissolved, Crassus had been killed in Parthia, and Rome was in turmoil with Pompey, appointed sole consul. Roman political opposition to Caesar had crystallised around Cato the Younger. In 50 BC, the Gallic War was over, as was Caesar's proconsulship. Cato forced through legislation ending Caesar's proconsular command. The southern boundary of his province was the Rubicon River, and if he passed it and into Roman territory, it was customary that he would do so without an army as a private citizen. Before setting out for Gaul, Caesar was accused of irregularities during his term as consul. When he had taken command in Gaul, he effectively moved outside the reach of the law whilst he was in office as proconsul. 
the immunity would be gone when he crossed the Rubicon, meaning he could face charges. Pompey refused to meet with Caesar to iron out their differences and rejected any compromise. For Caesar the choice was clear. The Senate had Pompey to safeguard their position with battle-hardened legions at their disposal. Pompey himself was already passing laws that made acts illegal after the fact, a measure aimed at Caesar. Caesar disregarded the Senate and crossed the Rubicon with the troops he had with him, and with words that have passed into legend declared, The die is cast. Caesar had counted so much to good luck in his career to date that no one can understand why he would try his hand again. He claimed his goal was to restore the rule of law, since under Pompey, as sole consul, the tribunes had been ejected from the city, ending the capacity of the popular assembly to veto legislation before the Senate. There was little opposition to Caesar in Italy, except at the city of Corfinium. Caesar's advance down the Adriatic coast, with his legions, had the aim of cutting Pompey's supply lines and protecting himself from any fleet actions as he made his way to Rome. He ordered the aristocracy to be brought to him and scolded them, but they were released unharmed. He seized none of his enemy's properties. The main army of Pompey had given up Italy, crossing to Greece, but Cato commanded soldiers in Sicily, and the old veterans of Pompey stood ready in Spain. Caesar sent commanders to Sardinia and Sicily, then moved against Pompey's troops in Spain. The battles were inconclusive. The forces of Pompey in Spain were outmatched and tried to fall back into the interior to raise troops. In an incident during this extended tit-for-tat, Caesar surrounded the opposing forces who surrendered. Instead of taking prisoners, Caesar released them, these soldiers began to spread word of reconciliation among his enemies. Pompey dominated the seas, but in an audacious move Caesar crossed from Brundisium to meet Pompey's army in Greece. However, the Caesarian army had issues in obtaining provisions owing to the naval superiority of the enemy. An engagement at Dyrrachium ended in a tactical defeat for Caesar, leading to an ordered retreat to Pharsalus, where he made camp and waited for Pompey to follow. According to the account of the historian Appian, Pompey had more cavalry than his opponent, but these were less experienced than Caesar's horsemen. Caesar expected these numbers to win against his cavalry, so he left 4,000 infantry in ambush to thrust spears into their faces when the horsemen came close. When the battle began, the armies clashed reluctantly, and as anticipated, Pompey was able to overcome the Caesarian cavalry. According to plan, the foot soldiers came forth and thrust their spears into the faces of the riders, stopping their flanking movement. The armies of Pompey were enveloped in turn, and his allies scattered in retreat, while his force dissolved into the waiting mercy of Caesar. Fleeing to Egypt, Pompey would be murdered by an officer of the Egyptian king, Ptolemy XII. Caesar is reported to have wept at the sight of Pompey's head when it was offered to him by Ptolemy's chamberlain. After Egypt, Caesar advanced against Pharnaces in Asia. He defeated him in four hours, and leading to the famous line, Veni vidi vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. Defeating his enemies, who had finally retreated to Africa, Caesar returned to Rome and was named dictator for life. Events aligned again to force Rome's attention towards grappling with the Parthians, Crassus had died fighting them, losing his legionary standards, resulting in a black eye for Rome and direct strategic consequences, such as leaving Syria open to the cavalry raids of Parthia. The Parthian Empire was extensive, populous, wealthy, and far more capable than the Macedonian successor states it replaced. Caesar began to raise troops and intended to invade, wary of nothing and certainly not the Ides of March of 44 BC, Caesar would be assassinated mere days before setting out to invade Parthia, killed by men he called his friends, including some he had pardoned, 
after the Civil War. Among his assassins were men he had served with, and Brutus, whom he had treated as a son. Twenty-three stab wounds at close range proved Caesar's ultimate weakness. Dishonour would succeed where no battlefield had, and he would perish in the political game for which he had reset the parameters. Caesar created the roots of modern Europe by parrying the Germanic threat, incorporating Gaul into the Greco-Roman sphere, and opening the way for a later conquest in Britain. He would fail in his attempt to become the first Roman emperor and desert his post in defence of the Republic. The dictator died at the right time to seal his military reputation, dying unconquered on the field of battle. Perhaps he would have dealt the Parthians defeat in his projected campaign east, but his comrade and best lieutenant, Mark Antony, hardly did any better against Parthians than Crassus had, so perhaps Caesar was lucky to have died when he did. The time of the Republic ended, and the time of the Empire was yet to begin. Even a staunch Republican like the historian Tacitus declared that the time was one when it was necessary for the powers of the state to fall on one man. Caesar would die in this ultimate attempt, and his adopted heir would carry his name into the institution of the Principate. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast written by Brandon Stanley, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>